context um, appropriately to draw the whole event to the end, uh, we have uh, Professor Lutz Christian Wolf, uh, who will be talking to us um, as our final speaker today. Um, a very short introduction, Professor Wolf, because uh, I think everyone knows Professor Wolf anyway, uh, possibly because of his infamous contract law is property law uh, seminar of a few weeks ago as well. Uh, but Professor Wolf, of course, is our dean. He's one of the founding members of the faculty. Uh, and of course, he's a, a well-renowned international lawyer as well. A practicing lawyer, an academic, interest in many different fields. Um, I was going to mention to you some of his sort of interests in research, but I think I should just stress as well, one of his most important achievements is he is the co-founder of the Greater China Legal History Seminar Series as well. Uh, so Professor Wolf, can I hand over to you as our final speaker today? Thank you very much, Steve. Um, we had a great conference today, and uh, it's my privilege to be the last speaker. Um, according to a German saying, I'm German, the last always get bitten by the dogs. And uh, I hope that the bites will not be too painful, but I'm of course prepared because what I'm trying to propose tonight is uh, somewhat controversial. And this is intended because I believe that legal innovation uh, is only possible if we start to challenge uh, established positions. And that's what I'm trying to do tonight. In addition, of course, um, after a very long and intense day, um, getting everybody ready for a fight uh, drags the last bit of unjust enrichment energy out of all of you. And that's what I'm trying to do today. So apologies for being outspoken and controversial. Um, our conference today is about the role of unjust enrichment in Asia. And as the name of this law, uh, this area of law suggests, the focus is on enrichment. The question that I wish to ask is whether this really makes sense. Um, I will argue that that's not the case, that we should rather change our approach and that such a change would have significant advantages. Most importantly, such a change would allow us finally to really understand this law, make it practical and make it clear to everybody. One last point, as the last speaker, the, speak, the sweeper, so to speak, I will take the liberty not to focus on one particular Asian jurisdiction, but talk about unjust enrichment from a more general point of view. Let's recall just once again, the law of unjust enrichment is based on the very fundamental idea that nobody should enrich herself at the expense of another, at the expense of another party, and that any enrichment should be given up. It's probably fair to say that in Asia, the law of unjust enrichment is less developed than in the West and in Australia, uh, but problems can be observed everywhere. Very fundamental aspects, as well as details, are controversially discussed. Some commentators still believe that there is nothing, not such a thing like unjust enrichment law, um, and uh, others, uh, remind us that we should probably bid farewell to unjust enrichment. Um, the law of unjust enrichment is often traced back to Roman law. We have heard a lot about Roman law and only Professor Martinek referred to the famous uh, writing of Roman jurist Pomponius, who is very often cited by the law of nature. It is just that no one should be enriched by another's loss. Jurisdictions around the world have, of course, picked up on this idea that any unjust, unjust enrichment is evil and uh, must be returned. Uh, the idea was then turned into remedial regimes. And in fact, on first sight, this idea sounds rather convincing, but only on first sight. Um, in the common law world, it's nowadays prevailing opinion that unjust enrichment claims are neither based on contract nor on a wrong. The justification for claims in this area of law seems to be, as the name suggests, that uh, the unjust enrichment of the defendant. As mentioned, I wish to challenge this proposition, this, this understanding, um, this focus on unjust and uh, this focus on the enrichment. And I will consider the focus of the enrichment de lege lata and um, also de lege ferenda. Let's look at the current status of the law of unjust enrichment first. And by doing so, I of course need to concede that while the law, why unjust enrichment regimes um, and probably the role of 
the law of unjust enrichment differs from jurisdiction to jurisdiction. Um, I have to concede that the focus is always on enrichment. Enrichment is dominating everywhere. In other words, the enrichment is the legalata central to the law of unjust enrichment. The enrichment of the defendant is the cause which triggers the restitutional remedy. More precisely, um, and it appears that the uh, enrichment is also the object of the restitutional remedy. Um, more precisely, it's the removal of the enrichment, which the law of unjust, which is the goal of the law of unjust enrichment in the first place. Now, the focus on the enrichment appears to be generally accepted and without much reflection. It remains normally, however, it remains unexplained why the law's response in unjust enrichment scenarios should be gain-based and not loss-based. In other words, leaving the rather chaotic historical development aside, in particular in Asia, but also elsewhere, we need to ask whether it makes really sense to explain the cause of action in unjust enrichment scenarios with the unjust enrichment of the defendant. The law of unjust enrichment provides a remedy for the claimant at whose expense the enrichment has taken place. Why then should we focus on the defendant, on the enrichment? Why not on the claimant? Are there any policy or even jurisprudential reasons which can justify the focus on the enrichment of the defendant rather than what really needs to be remedied? And that is what happened, what has happened to the claimant. According to the Cambridge Dictionary, a remedy is a way of solving a problem. But what is the problem in unjust enrichment cases, we need to ask, um, that requires the law's attention? What is the causative event? Is it really the enrichment of the defendant? Why should the law care about an enrichment if not because it was at the expense of somebody else, the claimant? Why should the law uh, really care about the defendant? Um, is it not correct to say that only the interests of the de-enriched claimant necessitates a remedial tool? The legal dictionary defines remedy as a means to achieve justice in any matter in which legal rights are involved. Again, why should any enrichment of the defendant be of any concern in order to achieve justice? Why should a restitution remedy be triggered in unjust enrichment scenarios when any injustice only stems from, the claim, what, from what has happened to the claimant. In other words, the claimant's de-enrichment or other loss or however you want to define this is what needs to be addressed and should consequently be the starting point. Peter Burks, the late Professor Peter Burks has remarked that whether a particular right can be called a remedy depends entirely on whether it's, re, uh, its relation to its causative effect triggers the metaphor of cure. Again, it seems rather clear what needs to be cured in unjust enrichment cases in the first place. It's not the enrichment of the defendant, um, but what has happened to the claimant. Does it make a difference? We need to ask that we are talking about enrichments which are unjust. To answer this question, it must first be considered if the law should order somebody to give up whatever he is not or she is not entitled to, even if no other party is involved. If private law is concerned with defining, regulating, enforcing and administering relationships amongst individuals, associations, corporations, then the author must be an emphatic no. The enrichment alone, without the loss of another party, would be a single party matter and should not lead to any need for private law remedial tool for private law remedial tool unless the law of unjust enrichment was to be regarded as a tool to punish or sanction the defendant. But sanctioning and punishing has never been identified as the goal of the law of unjust enrichment. In addition, the unjustness of an enrichment, be it because of uh, lack of a, a legal basis or because of unjust factors or because of any other for any other reason does not this does not automatically imply that the defendant was at fault or that there was any other reason for her or him to be sanctioned in contrast the fact that an enrichment qualifies as unjust ultimately stems from the fact that what makes the enrichment 
what is the enrichment belongs to the claimant. And again, this shows that the focus should be on the claimant de-enrichment, not at the defendant's enrichment. So I sum up, uh, to sum up, it must be the ultimate goal of this area of law that we are discussing today to remedy um, whatever um, is, uh, whatever has happened to the claimant. It therefore does not make sense at all to focus on the enrichment, whether unjust or not. The argument that the focus on the law of unjust enrichment should be on the claimant's de-enrichment must may be supported by the principle of formal rationality. The principle of formal rationality, of course, means that uh, legal doctrine should not be contradictory. The law of unjust enrichment forms part of the law of obligations, which is the area of law which governs personal rights and corresponding duties between parties. Now, what needs to be asked is if any of the other sub areas of the law of obligations provide remedies where the causative effect is the enrichment of the defendant. If this is not the case, then it should be explored in a second step. If there are compelling reasons why the law of unjust enrichment takes a different route. And I'm afraid reasons of this kind are not available. Does all this really matter? Is it of any importance whether the law of unjust enrichment focuses on the enrichment of the defendant or the de-enrichment of the claimant? Again, the answer is yes, of course it does. Unjust enrichment claims require the enrichment of the defendant to be at the expense of the claimant. So it's two sides, not of the same coin, well, of the same coin but uh, it would be utterly wrong to conclude that it is consequently insignificant whether the focus is on the former or the latter. In contrast, it rather appears necessary to focus on the claimant's uh, uh, position in order to be able to address core issues of the law of unjust enrichment in a compelling and coherent way. And I would like to give you just a few examples. First, the focus on the claimant's de-enrichment allows for a clear determination of the object of, the unjust, of an unjust, any unjust enrichment claim. If the focus on the de-enrichment, is it the loss of the claimant um, the impact on the, uh, on the claimant, uh, that is key. Without such kind of impact the claimant, uh, on the claimant, there should be no claim. Second, with the focus on the claimant, the claim must be object-oriented. That is, the claim, the unjust enrichment claim is, in line with Germanly, German law, probably contrary to English law, in the first place, in the first place exactly what has been lost and it is for compensation if a return of what was lost is not possible. In contrast, if the focus was on the enrichment of the de defendant, any unjust enrichment claim should require some growth of the wealth on the part of the defendant, and the importance of the difference between the focus on the claimant and the um, focus on the defendant becomes quite obvious when the enrichment is something immaterial, such as a service which has been provided uh, without basis or uh, by, uh, with an un unjust factor being in place. For services, the defendant would have to reimburse the claimant for the value. A focus on the enrichment means that the claimant can only go for expenditures which the defendant has really saved. If a service is something that the defendant would otherwise not have obtained, if, if it's something which is luxury for her or him, then she's not enriched. And it would be rather difficult to justify an unjust enrichment claim. With a focus, focus on the claimant's position, this problem does not exist. One more example. Um, there are many more, but I, I will just focus on one more. Uh, cases where the original object of the unjust enrichment claim cannot be returned because it was lost or destroyed. Um, in these cases, the defendant will have to compensate the claimant. The calculation of such a compensation must be determined on the basis of the value of the loss, that is the cost for purchasing um, a replacement at market price um, if the focus is on the claimant. In contrast, if the focus was on the defendant's position, on the defendant's enrichment, it is very difficult in the first place to justify a claim as the enrichment is simply gone. Somewhat illogically, 
the common law, common law jurisdictions address this issue by granting the defendant the change of position defense in certain circumstances. Um, it's illogical, and one may therefore conclude that even traditional unjust enrichment doctrine in common law jurisdictions take the de-enrichment of the claimant as the starting point without, however, acknowledging this. One more. Um, fruits, including interests of the object of the enrichment, should be owed to the claimant if the claimant would have received them without de-enrichment. In contrast, if the defendant generates the fruits outside of what must be regarded as the normal course of business, then, um, for example, because he has a special bargaining power or he has special contacts, um, then, um, in case of a focus on the de-enrichment of the claimant, um, the claimant would not be entitled to the extra. The entitlement would have to be capped. With a focus on the enrichment, of course, one may come to a very different conclusion. And this leads to my um, summary. Um, the idea that any unjust enrichment must be returned or must be given up sounds convincing, and it is not surprising that all the developed jurisdictions have fallen for it. This idea implies a focus on the enrichment, um, on the defendant's enrichment, uh, which is problematic, as I have tried to show today. In contrast with the focus on the claimant's de-enrichment, we would be able uh, to come up with compelling solutions in unjust enrichment cases on the basis of a balanced consideration of the interests of all concerned parties. And to reinforce this conclusion, um, we may even consider to restructure the whole area of law into a law of unjustified de-enrichment. While it's of course necessary to contextualize this proposal in order to meet the requirements of uh, different jurisdiction, jurisdictional specifics, a law of unjustified de-enrichment could serve as a tool to remedy unjustified de-enrichments which are neither covered by contract law nor by tort law. And there you have it. My proposal may sound a little bit radical. However, given the problems that the law of unjust enrichment has generated almost everywhere, the shift in unjust enrichment scenarios from the defendant's enrichment to the claimant's de-enrichment may not be as far-fetched as one might think. And with this, I will conclude. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you.